Okay. Wir sind live, wir sind online. Ich hoffe, alles funktioniert. Ich darf alle herzlich begrüßen zum großen Comeback unserer Vortragsreihe Nachts auf der Sternwarte. Der letzte Vortrag, der ist über ein Jahr mittlerweile her, im Februar 2020, war der letzte abgehalten und danach kam es zu einer durchaus längeren, Corona-bedingt natürlich ungewollten Pause, aber jetzt sind wir zurück im Online-Modus und dürfen gleich einmal einen sehr spannenden Vortrag heute begrüßen. Bevor wir zum Vortrag des heutigen Abends gehen, noch einige Worte kurz zum Vortragsmodus. Sie sehen den Vortrag heute auf YouTube über einen Livestream. Fragen zum Vortrag, wie bei unserer Vortragsreihe üblich, können Sie natürlich jederzeit stellen. Das Ganze hier auf der Seite im Live-Chat. Sollte irgendwelche Probleme auftreten, sei es jetzt zum Stream selbst oder falls Sie die Fragen nicht eintippen können oder was auch immer, dann können Sie sie natürlich auch an uns direkt wenden. Wir sind die ganze Zeit online unter sternwartennächte.univiac.at, habe ich auch in den Chat bereits geschrieben. Können Sie uns auch jederzeit dann die Fragen schreiben und die Fragen selbst werden wir dann im Anschluss des Vortrages an den Vortragenden weiterreichen. Der Vortragende selbst ist Erik Geidos und eine kleine Einführung wird dann mein Kollege Oliver Czoske auch vornehmen. Oliver, ich übergebe dir das Wort. Ja, danke Stefan. Auch von mir einen schönen guten Abend. And I will switch to English because the, the talk will be in English. So as Stefan said, our speaker today is Eric Geidos. Eric Geidos uh, joins us from Well, he is normally at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Hawaii in Manoa in Hawaii, in Honolulu. He is currently for this summer term, a guest professor at the Faculty of Earth Sciences, Geography and Astronomy at the University of Vienna. Uh, this is the Ida Pfeiffer professorship named after Ida Pfeiffer, who was a Viennese traveler and explorer in the middle of the 19th century. Quite a fascinating person who would merit, probably merit a talk of her own. Um, but let's concentrate on Eric. Eric uh, works at the intersection of earth sciences, planetary sciences, geobiology, and astronomy. These all come together in the study of exoplanets that give earth scientists and biologists an opportunity to branch out beyond the confines of this one planet Earth, of this one solar system, to gain a truly universal perspective of the conditions of life, habitability. Um, yeah, habitability, the conditions of life are one of Eric's research topics. Also biosignatures, the possibility of observing signs of life on other planets. So this is a broad, this is a very current and important topic in astronomy and beyond. And that's what this talk is going to be about as well. The talk is entitled Lava Worlds. Eric is going to take us on a fiery journey from early Earth to exoplanets. And with that, I yield the floor to, to you, Eric. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Stefan. Good evening, everybody. Good evening from the Stern uh, It's a beautiful place and I wish you were all here to join me. That won't be this evening, that'll be some other evening, perhaps. In the meantime, I'd like to take you on a journey, a journey both in time and space, to travel beyond our home, to learn something about our home, the way that uh, Ida Pfeiffer did, I think, in the 19th century. So as Oliver mentioned, I've been fortunate to be the one of two Ida Pfeiffer professors this year uh, in Vienna at, at the University and the School and at the Institute for Astrophysics at the Sternwarte. And I would like to talk to you today or this evening about a uh, phenomenon that we're very familiar with where I come from, and that is uh, lava. Uh, so I'm at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the Pacific Ocean. And I'll tell you a little bit about Hawaii in case you haven't been there. Um, 
But uh, as you can see in this spectacular image of the Kilauea volcano that was erupting in the past few years, uh, lava is an important process both for our planet um, and of course for people who live near volcanoes. So this is a picture of the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus. And you can actually make out the building where I would be spending my time if I wasn't at the Sternwarte. And uh, the structure behind you is Diamond Head. Uh, that's Waikiki in the background. And Diamond Head is actually a volcano, uh, no longer erupting, fortunately, but part of the landscape here. So you, for those of you who have seen Hawaii, who have visited Hawaii, you'll probably know it for its beaches, uh, for its aloha, uh, for the beautiful uh, fauna and flora that is there. But uh, Hawaii is actually uh, a very dynamic place. And where I am is actually part of just one of the islands. So Hawaii is not just one island. And in fact, the University of Hawaii at Manoa is not on the biggest island. It's on the most populated island, which is Oahu that you can see. This picture taken from space shows you the island chain. Hawaii is actually composed of seven large volcanoes, seven islands, and a lot of smaller islands where uh, nobody lives. But the, each of these islands is composed of one or more volcanoes that has emerged from the seafloor, the Pacific Ocean, and grown above the sea level to form a landmass. And the largest of these is the big island in the foreground. So we call that Hawaii sometimes to refer to that island, but we also call it the big island in case we need to distinguish that from Hawaii in general, which we can also refer to all the islands. So as I mentioned, each of these is actually a volcano or several volcanoes together. And the whole island has been built up of lava flows that have come from these volcanoes over time. And when you're on Oahu, you can't appreciate that as much as, of course, when you see a volcano actively erupting. But the whole foundation, all the rocks that you would be standing on if you were standing on the island, uh, are lava flows that have been built up over millions of years. Here in Waimea Canyon, which is a canyon in Kauai, which is uh, one island over from Oahu, you can actually see these individual layers exposed. And so we in Hawaii are living on either active or quiescent volcanoes that have been the result of lava building up these islands over many, many, many years. Of course, there are places in the islands where volcanoes are active still, Kilauea specifically. And if we were just to go down into the earth, uh, not more than a few hundred meters, uh, we would encounter temperatures that were very hot, and we would encounter the lava that you might think about when you think about that word, lava being basically molten rock. And so usually this is hidden from our view, except in eruptions. But here is a picture where you can see directly inside a volcano through a, a phenomenon that we call a skylight, just like the skylights on a house. You can look down through the surface on which you're standing on and, and no more than perhaps 10 or 20 meters below your feet is lava that is glowing because of how hot it is. And this is 1,200 degrees Celsius that you're looking at. So sometimes, of course, this lava is not content to stay beneath the surface. Again, we wouldn't have islands without eruptions of lava. And so in 2018, one of these eruptions uh, appeared actually in a development that was not very far from the Kilauea volcano. But uh, Hawaii is a dynamic place. And so uh, even though at times it may seem peaceful and tranquil, geologically it's one of the most active places on earth. And the, uh, the deal that we make with mother nature is that in return for living in this paradise, we sometimes are inconvenient by her construction projects. 
And this lava flow that erupted into this development in 2018 is testimony to this fact. So unfortunately, many people lost their homes in this. There was extensive property damage, um, but on the long time scale, uh, the trees will come back, the soil will redevelop, and perhaps people, for better or worse, will, will again uh, settle on this part uh, of the island. So this is another picture of one of the volcanoes from space that make up the big island of Hawaii. This is Mauna Kea. So it's not currently active, uh, but it is one of the larger volcanoes, and it only erupted perhaps a few thousand years ago. So the Big Island is the most active, and it's also the biggest, both in terms of the land area, but also the size of the volcanoes. So Mauna Loa, which is another volcano on this island, is actually the largest volcano on Earth. If it's measured from the seafloor, it's as high as Mount Everest, and it's vastly larger in volume. Mauna Kea is actually a little hill on top of Mauna Loa, if you will. But it's very special for those of us who are thinking about not just the earth, but as my uh, introducer Oliver mentioned, about planets around other stars and how they might be like the earth and uh, or not. And the reason for this is something that probably only those of you with very high resolution screens and very good eyes have made out already. And that is, if you can see my little pointer here, little white dots, specks, tiny white specks on the summit of Mauna Kea. And these are the telescopes of the Mauna Kea Observatory. Because this mountain is almost 4,000 meters tall, it is above, the top is actually above much of the atmosphere and weather that prevents us from doing astronomical observations from time to time. And so Mauna Kea is actually one of the best observing sites in the world. And many telescopes have been built on the summit. Telescopes which are being used now to tell us about this uh, diversity of planets around other stars that I'll talk about a little bit later. So the subject of today's talk it was inspired by a science writing class that which I taught at the, my university last uh, fall semester, actually, while the pandemic was raging. And these five young fine people were participants in the science writing class. And the product of this was actually uh, a paper. But the real product was actually an experience the students had in learning how to write a scientific paper, which all these students going through uh, our university should know something about um, when they graduate, or at least in my department. And they have written that paper, um, and this paper has been published, and you can find this online um, readily. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit and give you some highlights today about some of the things that we learned about and discuss in this paper that I think you might find interesting, things that tell us about our own planet and our own world, not just others. So since we our time is limited, I just want to talk today and try to answer or explain three questions. So what is lava from a geologic perspective? If we want to talk about it, we had better define it. And then what are lava worlds? What do I mean by that? And then, of course, why we should study them. So to give you the quick shortcut answer to the first question, I'll just tell you the answer right now. So lava is partially molten, gaseous rock that has erupted to the surface of Earth or any planet like the Earth. So that's, that's the short answer. But let's go into that a little bit more detail to see what that means exactly. In order to explain molten, which is, of course, liquid, we need to think about how matter behaves under different circumstances. So matter around us is typically in three phases, a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And scientists who study this phenomenon have a way 
of mapping, of creating a map, so to speak, of given conditions, what sort of phase matter, certain matter will appear in. For example, water, a substance which we know very well here on the earth and which actually exists in all three phases, depending on where you are uh, and what the conditions are. So this map we call a phase diagram. And so I borrowed the local environment to sort of describe and explain what this map means. So the two coordinates of this map are not latitude and longitude, but pressure and temperature. And so if you tell me where you are in pressure and temperature, I can tell you where you are on this map. And this map will also tell you what water is like at those conditions. So in Austria, pressure varies with altitude. Obviously, if you go high in the mountains, the pressure drop. Also, the temperature can vary. The temperature varies with the seasons, of course, and these days it seems it varies all over the place. But another phenomenon which I'm sure many or all of you are aware of is that if you also go up in altitude in the mountains, the temperature drops. That's a natural product of the temperature falling as a function of uh, altitude in our atmosphere. And that's described by this white line here. So I would travel with higher altitude on the vertical axis. As I would do so, the temperature would decrease on the horizontal axis. So if I want to find out where I am, I need to map where the different phases of water are. Water freezes, obviously, below zero Celsius. And it boils, at least at sea level, beyond 100 degrees Celsius. And what boiling is, is basically a transformation from a liquid to a gas. Those of you who also spend a lot of time in the mountains also know that boiling becomes faster and easier the higher the altitude or the lower the pressure. So while it, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level, if you go to the top of Grossglockner at almost 4,000 meters, water will boil at 87 degrees Celsius in your little uh, camping stove can. And so we can draw a line on this map which separates the gaseous phase of water with the liquid phase. And this is the boiling line. Whereas at zero Celsius, and it doesn't change that much with altitude, that separates the, the solid and the liquid phase. That's the freezing point. And of course, if you go up in altitude, eventually you will cross the freezing point. And that's why you have snow and ice, of course, in the mountains. And so anywhere you go on here, if you give a, give a pressure that is on the vertical axis, and a temperature on the horizontal axis, I can tell you what water, what phase water will be found in. And that's a phase diagram. Now, of course, the full phase diagram of water is much larger. We won't talk about this much today, but in geology and in many fields of science, we have to talk about conditions which are not found typically at the surface of the earth that are found in the deep interior of the Earth or in the high reaches of the atmosphere or even in space. And so the temperature range, again, the horizontal axis, and the pressure range, again, the vertical axis, is much greater. And what I talked about in the Alps in Austria is just this little gray box here, which only covers a small part of the diagram. But of course, in these other parts, Again, if you give the temperature and the pressure, I can read off this map what phase water will be found in. Now, we don't live in a on a planet which is composed entirely of water. And we're talking about not water, but rocks, rocks that are formed uh, from collections of minerals. And if you were to um, go into the interior of the Earth, and grab a sample and bring it up 
and look at it under the light of day, it might look something like this. So this is something called a peridotite or a dunite, and it's the most common rock on Earth, although you don't see it because it's so deep underneath our feet that it's hardly ever exposed. There are lots of rocks. Many of you might be interested in this topic, and of course, the Alps uh, and the local geology has a diversity of rocks and minerals. But this is actually the most common one. In the interior, the earth is green. The reason why it's green is because it's full of a mineral called olivine. And the word olivine is coming from the word for green, of course, in Latin. And as a result of this abundance of this iron-rich mineral called olivine, these rocks are green. But this is basically what we need to talk about when we talk about molten rock like lava erupting to the, uh, to the surface. Now, most of the time you can't see this, but as an aside, in Austria, there are actually places where you can see these rocks. The reason is, is that we have this colossal geologic umfall, this accident, which has been created by the collision of the uh, one tectonic plate, the African plate, with the Eurasian plate, another plate. And this has produced the Alps, which are still rising as a result of the forces of this collision. Everything is being turned over and, and, and um, exhumed in this collision. And in some cases, small amounts of material rocks from deep inside the earth get exposed at the surface. And these uh, dark lettered uh, zones here that are labeled on this geologic map are places actually where th these rocks like dunite or peridotite can actually be seen. So on your next trip there, look out for green rocks. So the phase diagram of peridotite is more complicated than water. Obviously, peridotite is composed of many minerals, not just all of them, and as a result, it's melting process and its phase diagram is more complicated. But the same idea basically applies. Now, again, the temperature range and the pressure range are well beyond anything that we humans experience normally. Um, but if you go to one part of this map, you'll find prototite and, and its minerals in a solid phase. If you go to another part, you'll find them melted. And so that boundary, is no longer quite so sharp because the rock is complicated. But there is a place where melting starts, we call the solidus, and there's a place or a boundary where the melting is complete, and we call that liquids. And, and you will also notice that uh, the temperature is much higher, of course. Rocks do not begin to melt until a temperature of at least 1,150 degrees Celsius is reached. You will also see a green dotted line on this called the geotherm. That's a little bit like the white line that I drew in the other phase diagram in the Alps. That's the natural change in temperature with pressure as you go into the earth, not above the earth this time. And this means that as you travel in your imagination deep into the earth to higher pressures, you uh, encounter very much higher temperature. So the earth is hot and this temperature uh, change is just a natural result of the fact that heat from the interior of the earth, from the decay of radioactive isotopes naturally produced is trying to escape. And that's basically why it's hotter inside. You will also see that everywhere you travel in your imagination along this green dotted line, you are in the solid phase of the map, of the phase diagram. So the Earth, by and large, is solid. Now, there, there is a part of the core, the metallic core, which is the center of the Earth, which is molten, but that's well beyond this uh, phase diagram, and it's not part of our discussion. That's a different material altogether, of course, metallic iron. But the what we call the silicate Earth, or the mantle, is by and large solid. Now it's not solid everywhere. Now obviously we have 
uh, lava being formed, molten rocks being formed. So some places it must be that conditions fall on the other side of this blue line, the solidus. And the way you can get there sometimes is basically by changing the pressure, the geology, geologic processes, change the pressure and temperature conditions. And Hawaii, the, the volcanic uh, zone that we call the hot spot of Hawaii is one place. Essentially rocks deep in the earth rise closer to the surface. They travel in this map to a lower pressure and they cross this blue line and they start to melt. Now, rocks are also different from water in, a different, in another way. So we think of, uh, if you go to a lake that's frozen in the winter in Austria, you might see ice on the lake and ice is floating because the solid phase of water is less dense than the liquid phase or the liquid phase is more dense. That's why icebergs float. But rock is different. It's actually more conventional than water. Water is a bit special in terms of its properties. And like most materials, the prototype rock, the molten version is less dense than the solid version. And because it's less dense, it's buoyant. That means it wants to rise with respect to the solid rock around it. And it therefore tries to make its way to the surface. And that's why it erupts. There's one more thing that actually uh, controls that process of rising to the surface, and that is the third component in a rock, and that is the gas. So it turns out there is a lot of gas inside the Earth trapped. And this gas preferentially likes to find its way into any sort of rock that's molten. It dissolves into the uh, uh, into the rock, like uh, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, can naturally dissolve into water. <clears throat> In fact, carbon dioxide is one of these gases. Water as a steam is also the other gas, the primary gas. And this dissolved gas in the molten rock, as it rises, wants to come back out again when the pressure is low enough. So just as you uh, experience a kind of uh, uh, violent event when you shake up your can of your favorite can of uh, of uh, a carbonated beverage like an almond milk or something, and you open that and release the pressure, and the contents want to come out uh, at high speed. When molten rock rises close to the surface of the earth, the gases that were dissolved in that molten rock want to escape. And that actually powers the violence of volcanic eruptions. We are fortunate in Hawaii that the amount of gas in the molten rock is relatively low. <clears throat> so people are usually not in direct uh, danger from volcanic eruptions, uh, as opposed to other places where there is large amounts of water that's dissolved in the rock. And when it escapes, it is extremely powerful and it can be extremely dangerous. So that of course appeals to uh, people, both scientists and tourists uh, for the volcanoes of, of Kilauea. So there are three components in a lava or what geologists will sometimes call the magma. That is the solids, the liquids and the gas. And they're all present when that lava is at the surface or erupting to the surface. And so I invite you to keep this in mind using um, perhaps a more refreshing analog, one that you might partake of when you're on the beach and the temperature does feel like it's 1150 degrees Celsius, but it's not. And that is basically an iced carbonated beverage. Um, we call these sh the shaved ice in Hawaii. I'm sure you have your own favorite version. So that's what lava is. Now, what is a lava world? Well, simply put, a planet where lava is widespread near or at the surface, that is not just in particular spots or zones like Hawaii, but almost everywhere or everywhere, that is what we call a lava world. And 
Today's Earth, the modern Earth, is not a lava world. Most of the surface, fortunately for us, is quite quiet and quite cool. Now, what about other planets in the solar system? Well, the natural place to look for a lava world would be closer to the sun. Because, of course, the closer a planet is to the sun, generally the hotter it is. And the two planets that are interior to the Earth are Venus and Mercury, shown here to scale. Spacecraft have visited both of these, and we know quite a bit uh, more about them. Um, in fact, NASA just announced that it's going to send two more spacecraft to, to explore our nearest neighbor, Venus, uh, in the next decade. Nevertheless, we already have, land, we humans have landed spacecraft on the surface of Venus. Venus is covered by clouds. It's a very thick atmosphere. And a result of that and the proximity to the sun, the surface of Venus is very hot and very inhospitable. In fact, the spacecraft themselves were fried and stopped working after one hour, but not before they could take pictures and provide some interesting data to us humans back on Earth. And we found that the surface temperature of Venus is 460 Celsius, but that's not hot enough to form rocks. That's still frigid for melting rocks. What about Mercury? That doesn't have an atmosphere to speak of, but it's um, much closer to the sun than Venus. But again, here, the maximum temperature, 430 degrees Celsius is well below the, uh, the temperature that's needed to melt rocks. If we really wanted to stretch the definition of a lava world, perhaps we could go to Io. This is one of the satellites or moons of Jupiter. Now it's in the outer solar system. Jupiter is very far from the sun. And the surface of Io is quite cold as a result. But just beneath the surface, there is a lot of lava and it's coming out all the time. In fact, the whole surface of Io is essentially a giant lava field. The yellow color that you see is the sulfur that is actually coming and erupting with the lava. And we see the eruptions themselves when we're fortunate to have spacecraft nearby as these plumes on the right-hand side that rise above the moon's limb that seen now backlit uh, by the sun. And we can even see the volcanoes erupting and stopping again uh, when we use our powerful ground-based telescopes like those on Mauna Kea to observe the planet it, it, the longer wavelengths of the infrared, which can catch the glowing heat from the actual eruptions. This is a time series of images of Io showing the volcanic eruptions coming and going. Those are the spots, on the, the bright spots on the surface. But Io is really not sort of a lava world. There's not lava everywhere, but it's close. So there just simply isn't enough energy in the current bodies of the solar system to maintain everything so hot close to the surface or at the surface. These sources of energy would possibly consist of, like the Earth, long-lived radioisotopes like uranium, which provide the internal heat for the Earth. There's also the energy released during planet formation, the gravitational energy of the pieces of the planet that form the planet coming together. And of course, there's sunlight. The closer you are to the sun, of course, the, the amount of energy absorbed from the sun to heat the planet goes up. And there are tides. This is the case for Io. It's the tides from Jupiter. There's also a phenomena, which is the same one you use for your stove, or many stoves, that is electromagnetic induction from magnetic fields. And then there are more exotic radionuclides or isotopes, like ones of aluminum that might provide a heat source early on in our solar system. But for the current solar system, none of these are sufficient to really create a lava world. And here's another sort of map to sort of show you why this is the case. So it's a little complicated and we don't have to go through all the details, but essentially this is showing again now in this map, now where the axes are time, that is the age of the planets as time goes on, and then how far they are from the sun. 
we call that semi-major axis in astronomy. And the Earth is up here. It's the big blue dot. It's at one astronomical unit by definition. And the other planets, Venus and Mercury, are interior. They're closer to the sun here. And we are living at a time now four and a half billion years into the history of our solar system. Down here in this orange zone, there's so much heat available that uh, conditions will be molten at the surface of planets. In these intermediate zones, molten rock will be present very close to the surface. So we might call those lava worlds as well. But up in this sort of upper right-hand corner, there, everything is too far from the sun and too old to maintain a lava ocean. This is where our planets, fortunately for us as fragile humans, exist today. So we're not gonna find lava worlds in our solar system, at least the present solar system. We have two choices. We can travel backwards in time to the early solar system, or we can go and find planets closer to their star, like the sun. So traveling back in time is relatively easy if you have space travel. And if you wanna see a lava world, or at least a lava world that was, I invite you just to go out on an evening where we actually do have uh, clear skies and look at the moon, because the moon was a lava world very early on. One of the most profound findings that the uh, Apollo missions uh, had was the discovery of the unique geology of the moon enabled by the return of samples to Earth. So the astronauts went, they came back, but when they came back, they brought uh, hundreds of kilograms of samples of rocks with them. And this is a sample from the Apollo 16 mission of a zone of the moon called the Lunar Highlands. It's brighter. You can go out and look and see that the moon is composed of a bright area, which we call the highlands, and then these darker Mari. So all of this is volcanically related, but the highlands are the oldest part of the moon, and they have a peculiar geology and composition. They're composed of a mineral called a anorthosite. And the anorthosite is very rare on the Earth, but the moon is full of it. And anorthosite has the property that it's very low density. It's a relatively light rock. It's full of a lot of light minerals, and that's what makes it basically light. So light, in fact, that unlike what I just told you before, anorthosite, the rocks, the solid rocks, are actually lighter and float in the molten rock from which they would have formed. And this is one of the lines of evidence for the existence of the moon as a lava world early on. And where did that energy come from? Well, it was the energy that formed the moon itself from the collision of two earlier bodies, the proto-Earth and another protoplanet, which some people call Theia, the gravitational energy, which is just enormous, released by this collision, melted most of the bodies in the moon form from the debris. So the molten moon, the moon started out almost completely molten and then began to solidify over time. Uh, because it lost its heat to space. As it solidified over time, some of the minerals that formed were anorthosite. And those collected because they floated to the top. They could float, right? This is a ocean, it's, it's liquid. They collected to the top to form the crust. Everything eventually solidified and you have a solid moon today. But that peculiar crust still exists. And is what you see when you see the bright regions of the moon when you go out on some nice night. Now, Earth also, of course, experienced the same trauma, right? It was also heated and most of it probably melted. And so it probably had a lava ocean as well, almost certainly. But 
because Earth is a geologically active place, unlike the moon, which is, has a very ancient surface, most of the evidence has been destroyed. But if you go to the oldest, oldest rocks, and there aren't that many on the Earth, and look carefully at them, you do see signatures. This is a picture of rocks that are 3.8 billion years old. So they stretch back over most of Earth's history, and they contain signatures of what might be that early uh, lava ocean in their chemistry. What about Mercury? Now, so the planets, other planets also probably form in a similar way to the Earth by collisions of smaller things. And so perhaps they too have lava oceans. And in the case of Mercury, it has a very strange composition. It almost deserves another talk because not only because it's just really unusual for a planet, but also because there is a European spacecraft called Bepi Colombo on its way to Mercury now. We'll get there in a few years and we'll know much more about the planet. But one of the recent spacecraft that visited called Messenger discovered dark regions on the surface. Those are thought to be carbon or graphite. And instead of rocks like a northosite, Mercury may have had a crust on a magma ocean that was graphite, the same substance in your pencils, if you still have those, uh, but it's, it's very buoyant and will float. And of course, the magma ocean was long gone. Mercury is a, mostly a solid planet now, but that graphite still re remains in sort of colors, penciling in these regions of, uh, of parts of Mercury that are seen were observed by Messenger. And there might be, this is more speculative, lava oceans or the remnants of lava oceans today, not on the surfaces of planets, but the interiors. Venus is hot. It's not hot enough to melt at the surface. But if you go down deep into the interior, there might be the remnants of a magma ocean that never completely crystallized, never solidified. It might explain some of the unusual properties of Venus but we don't know. We have to go back and learn more. So the other way to visit lava worlds, besides time travel, at least through the tools of science, to the early days of our solar system, is to go to other planetary systems and look for planets that are just conveniently much closer to their star. We don't have any such planets in our solar system. If we did, they're gone now or they never formed. But one of the things that has happened in the last 20 years is something we call the exoplanet revolution. So exoplanets are basically planets around other stars. And while 25 years ago on this, if I gave this talk, I would be in this part of this histogram in 1996, um, I would have very little to talk about in the year 2021, where the number of, cumulative number of exoplanets that have been detected is now well over 4,000, there's lots to talk about. Uh, so this extraordinary rise, which was beyond the wildest dreams, I think, of the, of the scientists who, who worked in this field, has been brought about by a series of, um, uh, ground-based instruments and space missions that have found many planets where we didn't actually expect them. Now, the principal method we've been using to detect this, these planets is called the transit method. And that's where a planet is on a geo, uh, is on an orbit which, but just by chance, causes it to pass in front of, it, of its star along the line of sight to us. And so it blocks out a little bit of the starlight. I'll show this plot again here. A little bit of the starlight is blocked and the star gets very subtly dim, dimmer for a finite time. We can readily detect these from space. It's much harder from the ground. And so there have been a series of missions, Corot, Kepler, TESS now, and most recently CHAOPS, that simply stare at stars, measure their brightness very precisely, and wait by knowing the planets that's there from previous work, 
or just looking for the next planet. You have to look at a lot of stars, you have to be patient, but this process works. This has produced most of the detections that we know. And here is another plot now. I think this is one of the last plots I showed you, showing this cornucopia of planets, this great wealth that we have now of other planetary systems that are very different from our solar system and are telling us something about planet formation. We just need to figure this out. Now on this plot, again, I'm using this term called semi-major axis, where the Earth is one, in, in this units of astronomical units, the Earth is at one. So the Earth is out here on the far right of this diagram. The vertical axis is planet radius. How big is the planet? And it's in unit of Earth's, very convenient. So the Earth is at one and one on this plot in the lower right. It's not shown here, but it, it would be put here. Now, Venus is somewhere here, and Mercury is somewhere over here. But actually, most of the exoplanets that we know of are much closer still. They are very close. Um, there are planets the size of the Earth. There are planets a little bit bigger than the Earth. There are planets that are as big as Jupiter, or even slightly bigger. All sorts of planets. But partly because it's easier to find them when they're so close to the star through these different methods, uh, we are finding lots of them here and not out here. They're, they're probably there. If I knew of all the planets, I would probably paint them all here and we would have many, many more thousands. But they're hard to detect. And the ones that we know of that are easy to detect are very close, very, very close. In fact, if you zoom in on the lower left of that plot and show the planets that, have, that we have found so far, you will find planets the size of the Earth, again, or maybe slightly bigger, that have years, that is the time they take to go around the, their star, orbit times of less than a day. So these planets, the, their year is less than one of our days. They are hurtling around in the gravitational well of their star at high speed. And they are so close to their star that they are very, very hot. And in fact, the colors of these points, each of these is a planet, is, represents the, the expected temperature of the planet. And you can see that this, this is in Kelvin, but this goes up to about 2,500 Celsius. So some of these planets are hot indeed. One of these is Corot 7b. It was one of the first exoplanets that was discovered by this transit technique by the Corot spacecraft. Hence the name Crow 7. So Crow 7b, we don't have a picture. We actually don't know a lot about it other than its size and, and a little bit about its mass. So we can use our imagination, though, and the, the artistic abilities of, of somebody to sort of describe what it might be like. So uh, nothing here is to scale. The star is not this close, um, but it's very close. And the point which is closest to the star, where, where you are sort of at the equator here, is expected to be around 2,000 degrees Celsius. And if you remember, that's much, much hotter than the melting point of rocks. So in fact, this whole hemisphere of this planet facing the star is expected to be molten, a sea of lava. On the other hand, the night side, and this planet might be synchronously rotating. So it's basically locked with one side always pointing to the same, to the star. That nighttime is extremely cold. There's some intermediate zone where things are solid and you can see because there's some light. Uh, and 2000 degrees Celsius is not only causing these rocks to melt, but some of the rocks will actually start to vaporize. They will actually turn into gas so there's a thin atmosphere that you can't see in this illustration, but we expect there to be a thin atmosphere that boils off and migrates to the colder regions of the planet, perhaps perpetually coating them with an icy rain or fiery rain of molten rock. So if we want to learn more about these planets, we would actually want to see them, right? And not just see the shadow 
crossing the disk of the star. And it's easy to see lava and hot stuff in the infrared, right? This is actually a picture of Kilauea, the eruption in 2018 using infrared cameras that see at longer wavelengths than our eyes can see. But hot rock shines, emits a lot of light at these wavelengths. And to study lava worlds, we need something like this infrared camera. But of course, the lava worlds are so far away, we need them on a big telescope and a really big telescope. And the good news for, for lava world enthusiasts is we're about to launch one of those. The James Webb Space Telescope will be the largest and most sensitive space telescope yet. It is designed to look in the infrared where lava worlds emit most of the light. And if all goes well, by November, uh, it should be on its way to an orbit past the orbit of the moon where it will study many astrophysical and astronomical phenomena, including exoplanets, for six years. So I invite you uh, back when I can talk about more about JWST's findings. Finally, I want to say a couple word, few words about why it's important to study these, this. Um, and this gets at basically the heart of why is the Earth like the Earth? Why is the Earth um, a habitable planet for us and for many other forms of life? And indeed, how did life and why did life emerge on this planet and not some other planet? And these are two of the great challenges, I think, of planetary science and exoplanets. And it was mentioned at the beginning that I work at this interface between biology and geology and astronomy. And this is where, uh, this is at, this is, these are the questions at the nexus of those fields. And lava plays a role in both of these because a lava ocean, like there was on the past Earth, actually controls what the composition of the rocks were on the early Earth. And what the composition of the gases that were erupting from the lavas were that formed the atmosphere of the early Earth. And the uh, molecules that would eventually form biology through prebiotic, what we call prebiotic chemistry, were probably formed by the interaction of the atmosphere with energy sources like ultraviolet and lightning. And so the composition of the early Earth actually was set the stage and perhaps was a requirement for the origin of life on our planet. So whether or not you had a lava world may impact whether or not a planet would eventually host life. Moreover, the properties, the mechanical properties of the rocks, which are set again by the presence of this ancient lava ocean, now gone, control the geology. Because on our planet, which is very active because it's still losing heat from the interior, that geology is expressed as what we call plate tectonics. The surface is broken into multiple discrete pieces which move around and jostle each other and collide like the African plate here colliding with the Eurasian plate, forming the Alps. And it's this process of collision which drives and, and, and motion, which drives essentially all the geology on our planet. And the interaction of this geology through the atmosphere and the geochemistry or the chemistry of the climate cycle on our planet is thought to keep our planet habitable over billions of years. And so life's emergence and life's persistence to the present day may have been due to that early uh, events of a long lost lava ocean. And if those conditions were different, you would perhaps get a very different outcome. An outcome we can't really appreciate if we were to simply stay on the earth and only study the earth, but only elucidates itself when we start to look at the other planets in our solar system, like Venus or Mercury, or even more so, planets around other stars where we can expect the diversity to be much greater. And of course, the numbers are much larger. So it's by exploring other planets, either in space, going out to the nearby stars, or in time, that we can better understand at home. 
And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you and take any questions. Mahalo indeed. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I just copy. There were two comments on, on the chat congratulating for this wonderful lecture. Um, don't see any direct questions. Maybe we give, yep, there's a clapping hand emoticon in the chat. We'll give a few seconds maybe for questions. I gotta say, I got a bit nostalgic when I saw the pictures of Hawaii. I, I had the fortune of spending six months in Manoa exactly 20 years ago. It's a wonderful place. Um, Rick, could you maybe uh, say a bit more on what you expect to see with JWST? And maybe also with the ELTs, the upcoming ELTs that will uh, be very much complementary to, to JWST in terms of their optical capabilities. Uh, yes, uh, JWST, what could we expect to see? Uh, so the most important and perhaps the easiest, I'm trying to, uh, measurement we can make is the temperature. Simply put, the hotter the object, the brighter it will be at the infrared wavelengths that we can detect. And although I'm stating here that 2000 degrees Celsius is the temperature of Crow 7B on the, on the, on the day side, um, I, we don't actually know that number. That is a theoretical number. It's probably close to that. But what that exact temperature is, is a function of many properties of the planet. How much light from the star is actually absorbed versus reflected back to space. And how the heat that's absorbed in the day side is actually transferred to the night side. So for the same reason that Hawaii actually stays very cool all year round because we have uh, heat, basically too much heat gets transferred to the poles. And if there's too little heat, it can come from the equator. Transfer heat for through this ocean and through an, through an atmosphere, if there is one, could moderate the temperatures. And thus by measuring the temperature and comparing this to models of how the heat gets around, we could actually infer the presence of the ocean and the atmosphere simply based on that. Now there are more difficult, but uh, equally or more exciting uh, possibilities, for example, of getting a spectrum of the planet. That is to um, sort out the light with wavelengths and that will potentially contain signatures of the composition of the surface, as well as any atmosphere, which would be of the planet, which is intervening. And that would allow us to um, uh, say something about the composition of the planet. For the extremely large telescopes, um, two of which are now being built in Chile, and a third has been proposed for Mauna Kea, they are capable of looking at planets that are further out from the star, but are um, not transiting. And so we can't detect them with the space-based methods that we usually use. Instead, they can be directly resolved and directly imaged. imaged. These planets uh, would have to be very young. So this would be traveling back in time, so to speak. Now we can't do this for old planets. We don't have time travel, except there are stars and planets being formed all the time. And we only have to choose a young planetary system. And this can be perhaps as young as 10 million years and look at the planets around that star. And those planets are still glowing from the heat of their formation, just like the Earth and other planets were also glowing as a result of that. And there we can actually do similar sorts of measurements to look at the temperature and to actually look at the composition. Um, 
this, these measurements are very hard. And of course, you're doing this from the Earth's bottom of Earth's atmosphere. So there's a lot of uh, very um, refined techniques that get used, and as well as the fact that you can build a much bigger telescope on the ground than in space, that, that helps. There was one question on the on the chat. Hasn't the, the launch of JWST been postponed to November? Do you know the details? Yes, currently. Um, that would be not unexpected. We yeah. uh, are now in a, a point where it is soon, but the exact schedule, of course, will depend on many things. The preparations of personnel and equipment, which will be, of course, always impacted by the lingering effects of the pandemic as well as more mundane things like the weather. So the October 31st should be looked at as the earliest possible launch date. And those of us who have been waiting for decades for this mission, it's been planned since the 1990s, uh, feel that perhaps a few days or a few weeks is not, um, is worth the wait. Thanks. Okay, there's no more questions. Okay. So I would have a question if it's okay mm -hmm. then. So Eric, thank you again also from my side for this very fascinating talk. Um, talking about very shortly about habitability. Uh, I mean, I think it is impossible for any kind of organism to live on the surface of such a lava world but uh, were there any observations or will there be any observations regarding the sulfur atmosphere for example so one could always um, consider the possibility that, for example, on a planet like Corot 7, where you are, uh, where the planet is tidally locked, the rotation is the same as the orbit, and the one side of the planet always faces a star, and that there is this zone we call the terminator that is close uh, to the uh, horizon here, where only a little bit of starlight is being received. And the temperatures, which are extremely hot on the day side and extremely cold, at 20 minus 250 Celsius on the day, on the night side, that the temperatures are intermediate. And that might be somewhere, you know, in this zone, I'm, uh, you can't see the mouse, I guess, but in, the, in where my uh, arrow is. Um, and you know, there might not be an atmosphere on such a planet, but maybe in the ground. And, and so who knows? Uh, they're, 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 we shouldn't rule this out. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, volcanism is associated with the production of chemicals that can be used by organisms for energy. So mostly the Earth's biosphere depends on sunlight either directly by plants or those who eat the plants or those who eat the ones that eat the plants, right? Which would be us um, and the vegetarians. But there are organisms on our planet that don't need sunlight at all. They live around hot springs uh, in places like Iceland where they thrive on the chemistry that's being produced deeper in the, in the planet underneath Iceland. And of course, if as long as there's water and some other chemicals around, um, that process would be occurring on, on in some regions of lava worlds that would be cool enough as well. So it's it's wise, it's 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 good to speculate. It's not good to, to limit the possibilities that nature might have in store for us. It's best to go find out. Thank you very much.
So I don't have anything else. There were questions, of course, regarding the future of our lecture series. Maybe Stefan, do you want to reply? Okay, so special thanks again to Eric. Thank you very much again for this talk. Yeah, okay, so I will uh, share my screen now to give you a hint what is coming regarding the talk series. So, of course, we want to stick to this talk series. I will stick to English now and then uh, come back later to German also. So the next talk in July, exactly on the 9th of July, about supermassive black holes by Sabine Tata will be held online again and online only. Then in August, we are going into the summer break. And after August, possibly with the beginning of September, we want to have this lecture series also at the Sternwarte at the observatory again, maybe also as some kind of hybrid mode that you can either come to the Sternwarte or maybe watch it also at home. So we will uh, test it over the summer months. And of course, we will give uh, some notes and news on the website of the Department of Astrophysics about it. Ganz kurz nochmal auf Deutsch. Am 9. Juli findet der nächste Online-Vortrag statt zu supermassiven schwarzen Löchern von Sabine Tata. Der wird, wie gesagt, online stattfinden. Im August selbst wird dann Sommerpause sein. Und ab September möchten wir mit Nachts auf der Sternwarte wieder äh, auf die Sternwarte in den Vortragssaal zurückkehren. Eventuell sogar mit einem Hybridmodus, wo dann äh, quasi die freie Entscheidung ist, ob der zu Hause verfolgt wird oder man auf die Sternwarte kommt. Aber Informationen dazu werden wir natürlich dann zeitnah auf der Website des Instituts für Astrophysik ähm, geben. Gut, dann vielen herzlichen Dank äh, von unserer Seite für die Teilnahme. Uns freut es wirklich sehr, dass äh, es dann doch einige geschafft haben und dass die ähm, Vortragsreihe wieder zustande gekommen ist. Und natürlich äh, werden wir ab jetzt wieder jeden zweiten Freitag im Monat äh, dabei bleiben. Damit von meiner Seite, ich glaube auch von Olivers Seite, ähm, vielen Dank nochmal fürs Kommen. Einen ja. schönen Abend noch mhm. und dann vielleicht bis zum nächsten Mal. Dankeschön. Ja auch. And thanks a lot to Eric for this truly wonderful lecture.